So the part of the chapter I want to focus in on, <clears throat> excuse me, this evening is in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, where the Bible reads, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And the title of the sermon this evening is Th Things to Think on. Things to think on. And it's kind of be a, a little bit of a different sermon, not something I've really uh, done before in the past, and we'll see how it goes. But this is a passage that I've always kind of always had on my mind, and, and something I've always kind of wanted to preach is just go through this list and point out some of these things. And I think it's important because we need to learn how to direct our thoughts. Our thoughts are something that we should learn how to direct and not the other way around. I mean, a lot of times we as human beings, especially when we get in the flesh, is our thoughts tend to tend to direct us. You know, it tends to, to direct how we feel or even the things that we do. So I think it's important that we stop and consider what type of things should we be thinking on. And the Bible here gives us a great list of all of these different things to think on. And I remember early on in my Christian life, when I was trying to really kind of get control of my thoughts, uh, this was a great passage that I actually memorized. And I would just sit there and I would think, and I would come to that first thing and think, okay, what's, whatsoever things are true. Well, what kinds of things are true? And I would sit there and try to think about true things and honest things and just things and pure things and lovely things and so on and so forth. And I've always kind of wanted to preach a sermon on that, and maybe it'll be a helping and a bless, uh, blessing to those of us tonight. And it would just help us to uh, understand that we need to take control of our minds and that this is a great passage with which we can do that. The Bible says, if you would, keep something there in Philippians, but go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 3, the Bible reads, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, Casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Verse 5, the very end there, And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, that's the goal, is to bring into captivity every thought. Now, that's a daunting task, to sit there and try to say, I'm going to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. I mean, if you were to set out to do that, you would find it would probably be more of a struggle than we realize. That it's hard to make sure that our thoughts, the things that we think, the things that we're meditating upon, are always pleasing unto God. They're things that God would approve of us thinking about. And here's the thing, a lot of time when people are trying to you know, get a right thought life, not allow their mind to wander into places it shouldn't or dwell upon things that maybe not are even necessarily sinful, but things that just aren't helpful. Things, you know, my people might begin to tend to dwell on the past too much or they might tend to think about uh, just, just things that have no value. There's kind of just daydreaming, letting the mind go and just wandering about. When people try to get away from that, they kind of get into this, it could be possible they try to just think that it's, well, it's just a matter of not thinking those things. You know, but what you're doing is you're just kind of making a void. And you can't just make a void in your life, especially in this area of your thoughts. You can't just make a void because then you get that look on your face and everyone wonders what's going on. You know, kind of like the Eastern religions, right, where you got to reach the no thought, where they literally teach that you should just try to have a blank mind, right. you know, which is, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. <clears throat> because the problem is when you break a void in your thinking, you know, some, it's a vacuum. Something's going to fill it. Something's always going to take its place. So the mind must be occupied with something. We have to direct it in a, in, in, in a, into a certain you know, direction. We have to make sure that we're thinking about things that are godly. I and mean, isn't the world very good at occupying our mind? I mean, the world has gotten very good at it today. I mean, we think about just the television alone, you know, which, you know, when I was growing up, that's really all we had. I mean, nowadays you have tablets, you have smartphones, you have laptops, you have computers. I mean, even when you're at the gas station, at some of them, they'll have a little video that you can watch while you're getting your gas. I always hit that mute button. I can't, I can't yeah, stand it. There was, you know, it's a commercial for something dumb. But the point is, is that the world, you know, with their billboards and their, and their magazines, and they're just always trying to fill our minds with what we should think or how we should feel about something, and that we spend a lot of time letting the world direct our thoughts and not necessarily maybe the, the Word of God. <clears throat> you know, I was reading an article uh, when I was thinking about the sermon, and I, and I looked up just how much time people were spending watching television, just television. Not counting every th all the time we spend on our phones and every, every other form of media that's available to us today. But the average American today spends five hours watching television. Five hours. That's the average. That means there's people that are watching less television, 
And that also means there's a lot more people that are watching more television than five hours. They're taking in more than five hours of television a day. Now, I'll admit it, when I was a, when I was a teenager growing up, I was a TV junkie. Like when I came home from school, man, the idiot box went on. It was tortilla chips, PB&J, and a glass of milk, and I watched the cartoons, and then it turned into whatever came on at seven. All I mean, I would sit there for, for multiple hours, just nonstop watching television. And it's a shame because I can never get that time back. That time is gone. I mean, think of all the other things. If you had five hours every day, the things that you could do with five hours. If you applied your mind into to doing something, to, to developing a skill, whatever it might be. I mean, you pick the subject or whatever it is you want to do. If you could devote five whole hours. I mean, if any of us, you know, especially, you know, if those of us that are busy, you know, trying to find five hours to carve out time, I mean, that can be a little bit of a task. You might be lucky if you could cry, carve out two or three. So I don't know where people are finding all the time to spend five hours, but really it, it is available. I mean, if they're coming home from a, from a, a normal job, just a 40-hour work week, you know, and they're working their nine to five, they're coming home at night, I mean, it'd be really easy just to plop down at six and stay up till 11 or maybe even later, take in all the late shows and everything else, and let just the television just fill your mind and direct your thoughts. And you're going to wake up the next morning and all that stuff that just filled your mind is what's going to be direct your thoughts the next day. The radio that you're listening to on the way to work, you know, that's going to affect your mind, the way you think. These things are going to affect your mind. And it's often very vexing things that we find in the world. The world isn't telling us a lot of good news today. You know, we preached a little bit about this morning about, uh, you know, the, the ban, the, or the, not the ban, but the, the, the abortion bill in New York. I mean, that's not a pleasant subject to have to talk about, but it's making the news rounds. You know, imagine just having that in your mind day in and day out, those type of things, all the, all the wars and, the, and these laws and all the, everything that's going on in our country and in our world today. Just constantly, every day, you know, maybe up to five hours a day, just filling your mind. And it'd be very easy to see how you could just vex your own soul by just allowing yourself and your mind to just wander and be filled with whatever the world wants to put in. So when we're trying to clean up our thoughts, when we're trying to direct our thoughts in a godly way, you know, we can't just make a void there. We can't say, well, I'm just going to stop thinking about these things. That's a good place to start, but you actually have to decide to start thinking about some other things. And this list is given us here. You know, we can fill that void with godly things, you know, such as reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, you know, singing psalms or songs and hymns and spiritual songs. That's a great way to occupy the mind. And if you're trying to keep your mind from wandering off, you know, you can just start singing a hymn. You know, and try to, you could actually end up probably memorizing hymns that way. I know when I was early on in my Christian life, that's how I learned a lot of hymns. I would just sit down at home and I would just sing the hymns by myself and just try to keep my mind occupied. These things that we, if we do that, if we'll fill our mind, this void, if we fill it with things as the Bible, godly things, you know, what it's going to do is it's going to give us peace. If we're filling our minds with the things from the world, it's not going to give us peace. It's going to vex our souls. It's going to bring us angst and, and paranoia. I mean, we're living in a very fearful and paranoid culture today because they're not filling themselves with the things of God. The Bible says, to go into to Romans chapter 7. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. The man that keeps his mind stayed on God is thinking about God's word, is thinking about the things of God. His mind, if he keeps it there, will bring him peace, Amen. the Bible says. You see, the battle often with sin, even, is lost or won in the mind. That's often where it begins. If you look in uh, Romans 7, look at verse 21, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind. See, the flesh, you know, it's going to start to come up and try to make us, we're going to think about wanting to fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's where the battle begins is our mind. That's where the war against the law of our mind begins bring, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So it's very important that we begin to direct our minds and understand that our minds is where the battle is won or lost against sin. So what are some of these things? Now I just want to kind of go through verse 8 here in Philippians 4. So if you kept something there, just go ahead and turn back. And we are going to turn to a lot of scripture tonight, but just keep something in Philippians 4. And I just want to kind of go through these things and, and what are some of these things that we can think about? That's what the title of the sermon is. Things to think on. What kind of things should we be thinking on? Well, let's just go through this list tonight and look at some of these. Now, I'm not going to look at all of them for sake of time because I found out very quickly when I was writing this sermon, the Bible speaks a lot about each of these things. 
And if we were to go over, each one of these could be a topic in and of themselves. But sometimes it's nice to just go through a list in the Bible and just meditate upon it, talk about it, and see what we can get out of it. So it starts, first of all, right there, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. That's one of the first things the Bible lists for us to think about. These are the things that we should think on. He says, think on these things. What's the first one? Whatsoever things are true. So when we step back and say, let's think about things that are true. What are some things that we can think of that are true? Well, one of the things that first popped into my mind is we could think about men in our lives that are true. I mean, isn't that great to know that we have some faithful men in our lives that are true? Or other people even. But I think especially of our pastors, our fellow laborers in the church, you know, our, our brethren in Christ. And I'll, and I'll be perfectly honest. I thought about people in this church and thought, man, what a, it's great to, to just think about what a faithful man this guy is. This guy's faithful to the service. This guy's faithful to the soul winning that's going on and, and, and loves the Lord. You know, I thought about that. Why? Because that individual is true. They're sincere. You know, we can think about preachers. You know, other preachers we want like to take, uh, they're preaching in online or, or we, we look forward to meet, hearing them preach in person. We can think about these people to say, what a blessing it is to know that we have some people in our lives that are true. Amen. <laughs> That's something the Bible talks about. It says in Exodus 18, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them. So when uh, when Mo Moses' father-in-law is telling him, hey, you need to, you, you need to you know, delegate some of this responsibility that you've taken on and, and judging the people of Israel, he tells him to look out certain men. He tells him to look out men of truth. And it's great to know that we have some men in our lives that are men of truth. I mean, could we easily say that we know some men in our lives that are not true? People that are very, you know, uh, dishonest. I mean, there's very dishonest people out in the world today. People who do not care about the things of God. So it's good to stop every once in a while and maybe think about some men in our lives that are true. A man of God. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Isn't it great to know that we have preachers in our lives who the word that is in their mouth is truth. Amen. That they're preaching us the true things of the word of God. Amen. They're not deceiving us. They're not handing the word of God deceitfully. But they are actually trying to teach us the words of truth. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We ought to think about things that are true. One of the things we can think about when we stop to meditate on what kinds of things are true, we can think about the men, the pastors, fellow laborers, preachers that are true. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, But I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handing the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending to ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I mean, we could definitely look these days, you know, and even people that we might have considered to be true in the past, and people that have let, let us down and think, and we could dwell on that and we could say, man, it's too bad that this guy turned to be out a, a fake or a phony. And, you know, I could think about several people over the past in my Christian life that have, that have you know, have, have turned out to, to, to let me down or, or, or hurt or be a, a harm to the, the cause of Christ. And we could dwell on that. Or we could dwell on the fact that there are people in our lives, people that we do know, that have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, Amen. that are not walking in craftiness, that are not trying to you know, be something, you know, be one thing one day and something else another. That they're sincere. That they're not handling the word of God deceitfully as so many are today. I mean, think about all the people we meet out door knocking go when we go soul winning that are just being absolutely deceived by people who are handling the word of God deceitfully. We talked to that lady, that Jehovah's Witness Day. I mean, she knew her stuff and I knew it wasn't even worth getting into discussion about with her. And I knew that I lost, I would lose her right when I got to the, to the verses about hell in my gospel presentation. And sure enough, I did. But it was a shame that that woman is being deceived by individuals out there who are handling the word of God deceitfully. Yeah, right. And we should think about these things and meditate about the fact, if we want to think about something that's true, praise God that we have some people in our lives that are preaching to us the truth. Amen. Go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. You know what, go ahead, turn to Psalms chapter 33. I'll wrap up on this point. I'll read to you from Hebrews 13. Just go to Psalms 33. Psalms 33. We should be thankful for people who have preached to us the word in truth, not deceitfully. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You want to meditate on something that's true? We can meditate about the fact that we have men 
fellow laborers, Christians, people who are standing on the Word of God that are sincere and true and honest. Think about the fact that God is true. I mean, that's something. Even if men let us down, we can always think about, well, what's something true, Lord? Your Bible tells me here that I ought to meditate and think on things that are true. Whatsoever things are true. What's something that's true? Well, God is true. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Exodus 34, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord God, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. God is abundant in truth. We have a God who the, there is no lie in him. He is truth. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, He is the rock. His work is perfect for all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. You're there in Psalms 33. Look at verse 3. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. You know, if we were to stop and meditate upon the, on the fact that God is true, that God is honest, that God is abundant in truth, it might, it might bring us to the place where we actually begin to sing unto him a new song. We might actually begin to sing and play skillfully with a loud noise. We might actually find ourselves lifting up our voice in praise unto a God that's true. But the question is, will that ever happen if we don't stop and allow our minds to think on these things? <clears throat> Go ahead and turn over to Psalms 100. Psalm 100. <clears throat> God is true. That's something that we can think about. The Bible says in Titus 1, <clears throat> in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Mm -hmm. God couldn't lie if He wanted to. It's not even in His nature. Because we know that, the, that a lie is what comes from the devil, that the, he is the father of lies. And that's, that's who, who, who the lie comes from. Look at Psalms 100, verse 4. Enter in his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth unto all generations. I mean, isn't it great to know, to think, and meditate upon the fact that God is true? And that not only will he be true in our lifetime, but it will be true in the lifetime of our children and our children's children, that the same God that we serve today will still be the same God that our children could serve one day? Amen. That God is the God of truth? <clears throat> That's something we could think about. That's something we could occupy our mind with rather than whatever the world would have us to think on. We could also think about what it means to walk in truth. Just what? How are we going to walk in truth? Knowing who God is, knowing the things that the men in our lives who spoke, spoke to us truth have spoken unto us. What does it mean for us to walk in truth? Go ahead and turn over to Psalms 15. The Bible says in Psalms 25, you're going to Psalm 15, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For I will the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Have you ever stopped to ponder and think about how we can walk in truth? What God wants us to do? The Bible says in Psalms 15, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Amen. Maybe we should try walking in truth. Maybe we could think about what could we do better to be found walking in truth. Go ahead and turn over to Psalms 26. Psalms 26. The Bible says in Psalm 43, O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead, thee, lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill, unto thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of my God, unto my God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O my God. He's saying, send out thy light, send out thy truth, let them lead me. You know, if we meditate about the fact that we want to walk in truth, we might find ourselves praying and asking God, God, show me the truth. Open thy, mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Guide me in the way everlasting. The Bible says in Psalm 26, verse 1, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. You know, we should think about what we can do to walk in the truth. Not just know what the truth is, but to actually live it out and to do it. So if we walk in the truth, you know, and we understand that God is true, and we walk in his truth, maybe we can think about where that truth will lead us. Where will truth lead us? That's something to think about. These are just thoughts that I had as I was sitting down and thinking on things that are true. Where will the thoughts lead us? Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. So if we think on things that are true, and we think about maybe walking in the truth, maybe we can think about well, where will the truth lead us if we walk in it. The Bible says, and you're going to John 14, but it says in John 8, 
Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we walk in God's truth, if we meditate on God's truth, and we understand that God is true, and we start to walk in his ways, and the ways of truth, it will lead us to the place where we shall be made free. Maybe we won't be in bondage to that sin that's, that's been you know, you know, troubling us and holding us back. Maybe we won't be end up going to those places we used to go to. Maybe we won't be hanging around with those people that we used to hang around, but we'll be actually be free. We'll be free from those things. Look at John 14, verse 6. Jesus saying to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, if we were to know the truth and be set free, if we were to know the truth of the gospel, it would lead us to the Father Amen. through Jesus Christ. You know, we could think about the fact when we're thinking about things that are true, we could think about the fact about how we have the truth. Isn't that great? Amen. That we have the truth. You say, what do you mean we have the truth? Well, look down in your hand there. Right there. You have the truth. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Jesus said, uh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I and mean, we talk about people who want to, you know, who are in the truth movement. They're all about the truth. Well, here's the truth right here. Yeah. We can know all the truth there is to know about God right here. Amen. That's a great thing to think about. So that's what we can think about when we think about whatsoever things are true. It goes on and says there in Philippians 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. Now, I didn't make a list on honest, but I thought, you know, in truth and honest, that almost seems like it's redundant. But when you think about it, the truth is just the truth. It's no matter what. You know, the truth is the truth. Honest is whether or not you're going to acknowledge the truth as the truth. You know, we could think about things that are honest, and that would be a whole other, you know, I, I don't, it's not in my notes. I'd have to shoot from the hip here, so I'm not going to. But you could kind of think about not everybody's honest about what the truth is, are they? Right. So that's just a thought on, on, on those things which are honest. And he goes on and says, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. <clears throat> and that's what I want to focus in on next is whatsoever things are pure. Go ahead and turn over to Exodus chapter 25. What are, whatsoever things are pure. God wants us to think about things that are pure. So when I sat down and I started to think, well, what kind of things are pure? Well, God desires his vessels to be pure vessels. I thought that was very interesting. Now, we see a picture of that back in Exodus 25. If you're there, look at verse 10, that God desires to use pure vessels. We're going to read quite a bit of scripture here, so keep up with me. It says in Exodus 25, verse 10, And they shall make an art of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. And a cubit and a half shall be the breadth thereof. A cubit and a half shall be the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Pure gold. Within and without thou shalt overlay it. And shalt make a, a crown of gold about it. Look at verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. He wanted pure gold on his vessels. Look at verse 23. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof. And a cubit shall be the breadth thereof. And a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereunto a crown of gold round about. Verse 29. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and bowls thereof, and to cover withal of pure gold shalt thou make them. Verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candle be made. His shaft, his branches, his bowls, his knobs, his flowers shall be the same, of the same. Verse 36. Their knobs and their branches shall be of the same. All shall be, it shall, all it, it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. Verse 38, and the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold, of a talent of pure gold shalt thou make with all these vessels. When we think about things that are pure, we can think about the fact that God desires to use pure vessels. Amen. Now we know today that these, this course, talking about the instruments that were used back in the, in the, uh, the, the not the ark necessarily, but in the, the tabernacle, in the service for God, the priests and things that would use these things. But today... If you would, go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We are those vessels. Today we are the vessels, Christians, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, those of us that have believed on Christ. We are the vessels of God that God desires to fill with His Holy Spirit Amen. and to use in His service. And that God desires that we be pure. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But a great house are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, 
and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be an honor, a vessel unto honor sanctified, you know, made pure, set apart, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, that verse right there in 22, that's what led me to a Baptist church. That's what wanted me to find a good church, is the fact that I wanted to be around some people that were calling on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart, that they were doing things that they wanted to be used of God in sincerity and in truth. So that's something we could think about when we're thinking about things that are pure, that God desires us to be pure, that we should desire to be around those that are pure, that we could be instruments that are pure that God could use. Oh, well, how are we going to be pure? How are we going to be made pure? The Bible says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That's what cleanses us, is when we think about the, 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 clean, uh, is the washing the water of, of the word. When we let the word of God dwell in us richly, and it fills our minds, you know, it starts to push out everything else that is impure. The Bible says in Psalms 20, 12, or excuse me, Psalms 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth. You know, if we want to have a pure thought life, if we end up, uh, you know, if we want to be pure vessels, then we need to cleanse ourselves from the filth of the flesh and the filth of the mind. We need to let the word of God dwell in us and wash our minds, because the word of God is pure. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. So those are some thoughts about things that are pure. What are things that we could think about that are pure? Well, we can think about the fact that, that uh, we ourselves need to be pure as vessels that God can use. We should keep our minds pure. We should be around others that desire to be pure in their thoughts and in their actions goes on and says there in Philippians chapter 4, move on to another one. And this will be my last one for the evening, but it says, uh, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Now, I'm sure we could sit around and think of things about are lovely, but as a man, I don't know that I want to get up and discuss in front of any things that I think that are lovely. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, there's a lot of lovely things that we could think about. I mean, you can think about just nature itself, how beautiful God's creation is. I mean, I'm looking out this window now, and I'm watching the sunset behind those mountains. I'm thinking... What a beautiful tint of orange, you know, and the silhouettes of the trees and the palm, and the, the palm trees and the mountains. And that's a very lovely scene. I mean, we, this painting, I've gotten several compliments, you know, I didn't paint this, I just hung it up, but everyone's like, wow, what a great painting. Amen. You know, and it is, but what is the painting of something that God made? It's God's creation. You know, that's something that's a very lovely painting. You know, we could think about just the things that God has made that are very beautiful, things that are very nice to look upon, things that are very lovely. Those are things that we could think about. And don't people already kind of do that? Like I had an aunt who was really into bird watching. And she I never understood that until I started to actually really look at birds. You know, and I have uh, let me confess my my um, my fondness of things that are lovely to, to to you guys. I have one of the one of the on my Facebook, I had this group, it's something I don't know what group it is, but all it is is people posting pictures of these exotic birds. And every time I come across on my newsfeed, I just stop and I just look at that bird. And some of them are just the most amazing creatures you could ever look at. They're just beautiful, all the different colors and designs and the way they're made. I mean, whenever I see a hummingbird out around here, I have to just stop and just take it in and think, wow, what, a, what an amazing creature. They're very lovely to look at. So there's all kinds of things that we could think about. You can see what a great list this is. When you're trying to clean up your thoughts, when you're trying to think about things to dwell on in, in your mind, how you could just memorize this one passage, this one verse, in Philippians 4 9 or 4 8 excuse me and just dwell upon it and everything that comes up you could just stop and think about things that are true things that are honest things that are just things that are pure things that are lovely things that are of good report and even every single one of those things could just lead into more and more thoughts and you'll find yourself just thinking about the things of God it's a very powerful passage in the Word of God lastly what I want to focus in on there is whatsoever things are of good report good report now what does it mean by good report when you think about like a report card, you know, some of us had good report cards, right? And some of us had bad report cards, right? Well, what is a report card? It's your, it's your teacher reporting back to your parents, telling there's a, there's a, a there's a, uh, you know, uh, an assessment coming back and saying, hey, this is where he's at. It's a, it's a statement of the facts about where the student is at, good or bad, right? Um, <clears throat> You could think about 1 Kings, a good example of this would be, and with Queen Sheba, it says in 1 Kings 10, 
And when the Queen Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, had seen all of Solomon's wisdom in the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and the scent by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit under her, in her. And she said unto the king, It was a true report, report that I heard in my own country, in my own land, of, the, of thy acts and of thy wisdom. So someone had come to her and given her a report. They told her about another place. You know, they reported. You can think about a rifle report. You know, if you've ever heard a rifle go off in a distance, you know, it's telling you where that rifle is at. That's the rifle's report, right? I think we all understand what it means when it says of a good report. So what are, what are things that we could think on of things that are of good report? Well, we could think of people that are of good report. People who have a good reputation. People who, who's, who's, uh, that we can appreciate for their reputation. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. The Bible says in Acts 3, you're going to Acts 10. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, when we appoint over this business. Of course, he's talking about when they were ordaining the deacons, one of the things they wanted to have was an honest report that what could be said of them by others. Not what they would say of themselves, but the report that somebody else would give of these individuals would be a good report. So it's good to have people around you that are of a good report, people that have a good reputation. That's something we could think about. Maybe we could think about somebody who we could maybe look up to and say, you know, I, I can think of several people in my life that I can admire certain attributes and qualities about them and can meditate about that and think about how I want to, what I could do to make myself more like them in that regard. You know, whatever, what is it that they do that I, could, that I myself could begin to do, that I might have that good report as they do. So these are the types of things we can start to think about when we think about things that are of good report, people that are of good report. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews. So this guy Cornelius had a good report. You know, and it's not, it's no coincidence that before he had that good report, it says it's one that feareth God. You know, if you're one that wants to have a good report among men, it'd be very good for you to have a fear of God. You know, the person that fears God and walk in God's commandments, you know, they, they will have no evil thing to say of you. You know, that, and, and they'll actually be able to say, you know what, whether they like you or not, hey, the guy has a good report. Maybe the boss at work or whoever it is might say, you know what, I don't really care for where he believes or where he goes to church, but he shows up to work on time, he puts in an honest day's work, and i got nothing bad to say about him. He has a good report. We can think about people that are of good report. Go and turn over to Proverbs chapter 15. Another man that had a, a, a good report in the Bible was in Acts 22, and one Ananias, a devout man, according to law, having a, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. So he was devout. You know, he was somebody who was followed God, wanted to know God, that he was, you know, in, according to the law, he was in the Bible, he was trying to follow God's commandments. And what did it end up ha happening to him? He ended up having a good report. <clears throat> the Bible says that in Proverbs chapter 15, the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. Proverbs 15, verse 30, excuse me, verse 30. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? The good report maketh the bones fat. What does it mean by that? I mean, we could sit here, when we're going to think about things that are of good report, we could go, well, okay, well, the Bible says that a good report maketh the bones fat. And we could begin to meditate and allow our minds to be filled with the things of God, thinking and wondering, well, what does it mean when it says that the good report maketh the bones fat? fat. Well, I think it's interesting because I think well, one thing we can take away from it is that a good report can nourish you. I mean, you think about your bones. If something goes wrong with your bones, like if you get disease in your bones, I mean, that's what makes your blood. I mean, it's that's serious disease. It's hard to cure. Like if you get bone cancer or bone marrow cancer, very painful, very difficult to treat. And the Bible says here that about a good report make it the bones fat. You know, if someone has a good report, if you have a good reputation, it can be something that nourishes you. You know, maybe you find yourself in a bad situation. Maybe you find yourself, you know, backed up against a wall in some way or there's some false accusation coming against you. But there's, it's not going to stick because you have a good report. You know, that it's sucked down deep. It's into your bones. They're going to, you know, that good report is going to keep you. It's going to nourish you through that time. You know, a good report, it can nourish you. It's something that sinks in deep. You know, it gets down to the bones. You know, but especially what it made me think of, it makes me think of soul winning. When we go out soul winning, having a good report. You know, when you go out and when we get done soul winning, we always ask, how did you do? 
You know, when some people say, hey, we got X amount of people saved today or we got zero. You know, either way, it's a good report because the thing is, you went. Yep. You know, and the command is to go. So once you've done that, you know, you've obeyed the command, praise the Lord. Well, let's face it. We like to come back and say, man, the neighborhood was receptive. The people were ready. You know, we went up to San Carlos and the people were just, they were, they were ready to receive the word of God. They got saved. I mean, we were up there a few weeks ago. We got 31 people saved. Praise the Lord. That's amazing to have 31 people saved in one day. I mean, people will say, well, those numbers are overinflated. But here's the thing. We had, you know, a dozen people out there filled with the Holy Spirit preaching the Word of God for six to seven hours in one day, you know, in, in a receptive area. Those, that's not unrealistic. Right. When you have people who are going out there filled with the Holy Spirit preaching an unadulterated gospel, you know, efficiently and effectively, that kind of thing can happen. And you can get a good report that comes back from a place like that. You think of Pastor Joe Major reporting back from Jamaica of the, I don't, I didn't remember what the last number was, but every day I saw him in my newsfeed on Facebook and it was like 70 people, 30 people, 80 people. I don't know how many, but it was a multitude of people that were getting saved down there because, and I thought, praise the Lord, that's a good report. And you know, those, those good reports, those can sink down in us. You know, they can get, we should let those good reports sink down and get into our bones. You know, I think especially when you go out and, and you go out into a place and you get somebody saved. I mean, sometimes people get saved and, and it's just so matter of fact. It's like like you might as well have just had a bank transaction. With them, you know what I mean? They're just very matter of fact about it, not very emotional. And it doesn't have to be. You know, it's just human nature. And it's just, yeah, this is what the Bible says. What do you need to do? Do you want to do that? Yes. And they do it and bam, they get saved. The other people, it seems like, and I found this to be true on the Indian Reservation, is that they start to pour out their heart with you. It's amazing to me how many times recently I've gone out, I should say how many, but the last few times I've gone out soul winning on this Indian reservation, how these, these ladies will allow me to, I can think of one lady in particular, she just said, she let me talk and give her the gospel. And, I, and I'm a big, I, you know, I believe that there should be some give and take, you know, when it's nest, when, when appropriate in soul winning. That if a person's going to sit there and listen to what you have to say intently when you're giving them the gospel, that sometimes it's okay to let them speak. I mean, maybe not if they're trying to carry you off in some rabbit trail or bring up some obscure, silly doctrine or argue with you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about maybe when a person starts to tell you a little bit about the things that have done in their life. Amen. And I'll never forget this lady. I let this, this is a report that, you know, I'm giving you. It was one that has sunk down into my bones, you know, and it's carried me through some bad neighborhoods. I was out in Ahwatukee, you know, last week up in Phoenix, you know, Ahwatukee, or as, as I like to call it, all white tukey, right? <laughs> because everyone there is white and wealthy and well off and they you know they're just you know they, they don't have need of nothing right and every door was just like some of the rudest people i've ever had you know rude they, they were the nicest rude people i've ever seen i'll say that they have a very nice way of being rude to you mm -hmm. and uh you know and it was and i could let that get me down but i had this good report from this lady that i met on those indian soul winning reservation that nourished my bones that even i was going house to house in a place like Ahwatukee, I know that there was somewhere out there on one of these Indian reservations, there was a lady, like this lady I talked to. And I talked to her, and uh, you know, she started to share with me about the fact that she was a widow. That she had two sons, one had died, slipped in the shower, bumped his head and died. His other one, her, her other son, was a bull rider. And he was going up to some bull riding thing, and she said to him, you know, don't go son, don't go. And he went and he ended up getting gored by a bull and he died. And then shortly after that, her husband got sick and he died. You know, and my heart just broke for this lady. You know, when I gave her the gospel and she listened so intently and you know what? She got saved. Amen. She prayed, she received Christ as Savior and it was such a sweet moment with her and I walked away just praising the Lord that there was somebody out there who was humble enough and meek enough and, you know, I thought about how God wants us to go to the fatherless and the widows and how we reached one of those widows out there Going somewhere that maybe no other Baptist church would even bother going. Right. That the only other people, and she told me, is the only other people that would come around were just a bunch of Mormons that were so persistent, they would keep coming around, they would start going around her house looking in her windows, knocking in the windows. That's how zealous they are. That's how fervent they are. You know? But where are the Baptists going out there? Why aren't we hearing a good report back from them? Well, praise God now we've got one. Amen. That there was, well, at least somebody went out there and knocked that door and led that dear widow to the Lord. And now I have that good report that's made my bones fat. And now I can go to places like Awatuki and I can knock those doors and I can say, you know what, I don't care if these people reject it or not. 
know, of course, I want them to be saved, but if they go ahead and reject it, it's on them. And I know that someday I'm going to be going back to one of these receptive areas, I'm going to meet another person like that, and they're going to get saved. And that's a good report. That's how we think about these. And where, where did all this come from? Where did this whole sermon come from tonight? I mean, I mean, there was probably six or seven sermons that I preached here tonight. Any one of these topics that I preached about could be a whole sermon in and of itself. It all came from just thinking on these things. From just thinking on things that are true, thinking on things that are honest, thinking on things that are just, thinking on things that are pure, thinking on things that are lovely. Whatsoever things are uh, true, or, or whatsoever things are lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So that's my challenge tonight. If you're one that's struggling with your thoughts, I would start out by just memorizing this verse, Philippians 4 8, and just allow that to be a catapult into thinking on these things. Let's go ahead and pray.